Today's episode of the BS Podcast is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor and the only fan-friendly app for buying and selling tickets for sports and music. With just two taps on your phone, you can instantly buy SeatGeek tickets to an event, and then you can enter that event just using your phone, no paper tickets. Drop your old ticket app and use one that's built for 2016. Again, do everything on your phone. Download the free SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com. We are also brought to you by Sling TV, the best way to watch live TV on your turf. For just 20 bucks a month, you can stream more than 20 live channels, including ESPN, TNT, AMC, and CNN. No installation, no extra gear, no annual contracts, just an internet connection. And you are ready to go. Start watching for seven days free at sling.com slash Bill Simmons. And get Sling TV on your favorite device. Restrictions do apply. And since we're here and we're heading to Labor Day weekend, my new HBO show, Any Given Wednesday, returns September 7th, 10 p.m. You can watch the first eight episodes and every bonus clip we've done, including the new one we just put up. We put up a present for the city of Cleveland. You should check that out. Uh, they won the summer. We made them a music video. Check out all that stuff on HBO Now, HBO Go, HBO On Demand, our Facebook page, which I think is facebook.com slash any given W-E-D-S. A uh, lot of stuff out there. Check out my new website, The Ringer. Check out The Ringer Podcast Network. Subscribe to The Ringer NFL Show right now. Catch up on our big NFL preview. And shout out to Robert Mays, Kevin Clark, Danny Kelly, Claire McNear, and the rest of our NFL team over at The Ringer. I might pop up on that Ringer NFL show a couple times this season. I'm just ready to talk football with anyone. I just wander around our offices, just bumping into people, starting football conversations. I am ready. I'm also ready for this podcast. Let's roll. Yeah. Clear enough for you. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wow. I've done 120 podcasts, and somehow this man has not been on any of them, but we're changing that today. My old friend, my rabbi, Tony Kornheiser. How are you? I'm good. Now I'm your rabbi. That's great. I used to be your uncle. Now rabbi's a step up because rabbi means teacher. So I'm I'm feeling pretty good about that. You're still Can my I ask uncle you a too. Few questions before you ask me. Yeah, you're still my uncle too. You're just I've promoted you to rabbi. Well, I'm good. Well, yeah. I hope I hope have that line on the on the chart all to myself. How did you come up with the name The Ringer? Because I've got podcast issues, you know, coming up with a name. Yeah. And I wonder how you did that. We probably spent a month and a half trying to come up with a name for everything we're doing. I, I actually have talked about this in the past where it is just so tough to name things because 75% of the time you can't come up with a name and then the other 25% you do come up with a name you like, but it's already taken. And so just, it's somebody else's name? Yeah, or you know everything's that, I, taken. Yeah. I just, I didn't, uh, that's why I just called mine the Tony Kornheiser Show, and they wanted me to call it something with podcast, and I said, no, no, I like the name show better. Do you know in books, I'm sure they told you this when you wrote your book, Yeah. but in books, you look for a two-word title. Really? Yes. Apparently, there's been, hey, look, there are scientific surveys of everything, and there's reason to believe that a two-word title is the grabbiest, it's the best, and they want you if you can. Even though most people like us think that longer titles either have a built-in sense of humor or a sense of irony and we want them, the book publisher people who get paid to know this tell you, can you get a two-word title? Did I ever tell a you what I... I like? And they point to the Bible. They go, can you beat that? And the answer is no, you can't beat that. No. Did I ever tell you what I almost named my basketball book? No. Tuesdays. The Bible? No, you'll like this. Tuesdays with Hori. <laughs> 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 so that's, you know what? I had, and now you bring this up because of album. Album is, Mitch Album is a good friend of mine. I know. And one of the collections that I wrote, I actually wanted to name. I wanted to be on the cover in a dress, and I wanted the title to be Tuesdays, I'm Lori, and he got angry. Oh, no. He got angry at that, so I didn't do it, of course, because he's my friend. Well, he really would have been angry at Tuesdays with Hori. It was it was a few years after Tuesdays with Mori had come out, but I just liked it, and I thought it was a good basketball thing. The book of basketball. I think that's great. 
we we I actually I was competitive because I really wanted the book to do well, and I thought it had a chance to 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 debut at number one on the New York Times list. So I was studying. Which like, it did, didn't it? It did. Didn't it debut at one? It yeah. did, but I was studying like different book titles and things that would work and what would come up in Google searches. And it just made sense to have a title that had book and basketball in it. And that's how I, I would the think book of so basketball. if you're writing yeah. about a book about basketball. Right. So one of the collections that I wrote, remember when, when Dennis Rodman of all people had the number one bestseller in the country, which was bad as I want to be. Yeah. And I ripped that off and I, I sat on a motorcycle on the front of the book with no hair, and the title of the book was Bald as I Want to Be. <laughs> Who is it didn't help. It didn't help any sales. It was no good. didn't do anything. So. Didn't you name another one? Wasn't it like I'm Back for More Cash or I'm something? I'm Back like for that? More Cash. <laughs> I'm Back for More Cash. That was because all I ever did. See, you look, you're an actual writer. You have original thoughts, and you write at length, and this is a good thing that you do. What I did in books was I simply reprinted old columns right. from the Washington Post. So it made, since I was actually, literally, back for more cash, that's, that's what I did, yeah. That, sure. was a, that was a weird era when, when people just did that and that counted as a book. I think the internet has kind of changed that, cause, especially because so many columns are just available on the internet now. It's tough to just have a collection of... Oh, so you can't collect anymore. Yeah, I mean... So it, I got in under the wire then. Yeah, but yeah. I get, as, a, as an aspiring writer growing up in the 80s and 90s, those collection books were really important to me because I never got to read you. I never got to read Mitch Album. I remember I had Live Album 1 and Live Album 2, and yeah. I think there was even a third one, and it was like my only chance to read all those pieces. So I think that, I mean, there, there are people whose collections I admire tremendously, like Dan Jenkins and Frank DeFord, yeah. and it's great to have their best work you know, in between one set of covers, I, I just, I think those are invaluable. But in my case, I was just, you know, these were just 800 word columns. Right. That's all they were. They were nothing. I've know? thought about doing a collection of stuff I've written, like broken down in different eras or things like that. My Red Sox book was basically a collection, but I wrote a whole bunch of footnotes for him. And yeah, and I, I mean, I literally wrote like, I don't even know how many footnotes. There was three per page, so it was probably like an extra 40,000 words Well, that's or the something. creativity, right? That's the creative part. If you're going to do a collection and you're going to annotate it in some way that your fans are really going to like, then psychologically you feel, I'm giving them new work. I'm not simply trying to get money from them right. as and, opposed to what I did. And yeah. I wrote a prologue and an epilogue. It was the first fight I ever, I ever had with John Walsh, our, our mutual friend. Um he was he because I had sold it as a new book, and yeah. through ESPN Books, and then when I did it with the footnotes, he was like, "What the hell are these?" <laughs> he was yelling at me. But, and, it's, uh, but it's the footnotes. Yeah, it's the footnotes that reveal who you are and what you really think. It's the footnote. I would bet that your fans go to the footnotes more eagerly than to the text. I would think. Well, I, I, at the time, I think the footnote. Uh, the footnote revolution has kind of faded, but at the time it was a really fun way to kind of reinvent what it was like to read a book and especially like older stuff that maybe people had read and you could point out like, God, that was stupid and make you almost make fun of yourself as you're going along with it. You haven't, you told me a while ago, you said at age 44, your fingers stopped working. It's just it became hard to type. It be, I mean, all... Okay, I, I'm not one to complain about my life because it's been great. You've my career great has been great. Yeah, you're awesome life. And everything, everything that I ever wanted to do, I've been able to do. You play golf but with the I president. what I wanted to do most... Hmm? You play golf with the president routinely. You've had I, a great life. I have. I've, yeah. I've, yes, I've done that. Um, so but the thing I wanted to do most was be a sports writer for a newspaper, because now I'm going back 40, 45 years when there wasn't an internet, and you know, that, so, that, so that the highest calling for sports to me was to be a sports writer, um, and we, and it's so odd, I mean, we can talk about this. In those days, in the, when I started in the 1970s, and even through the 1980s, I would say, sports writers, though they made no money, 
they look down on radio guys and TV guys. Yeah. They absolutely look down on them. They thought these are just, the TV guys were just pretty boys, and the radio guys were schleppers. Okay, yeah. that's what we thought when we worked for newspapers. And now, of course, all of us work for radio and television. <laughs> but I got this at a very young age, and I worked as hard as I could and as long as I could, and I don't even know where the energy came from. And then I got to a point where I felt... I not only wasn't getting any better, I was repeating myself, and I was getting worse, and I was looking around at people who were doing what I did for a living, and I, I said, God, he's better. He's better than I am. It's just sort of like in golf when you, you, you can't get longer anymore as you get older, and you go, wow, what am I doing here? When do I have to move up to the other tees? And, and so at around that age, and fortunately for me, at around that age, I started doing you know, that style column, so that was... That was reinvigorating to some degree. But in terms of sports, yeah, I thought, honestly, Bill, I thought I was going backwards. I did. So, I mean, it was, it was okay for me to leave it. I tried to reinvent myself with these tiny little columnettes. Yeah. And I gave it a nice title, you know, a, a few choice words. And I would try to write something like no more than 200 words. But the sports editor I was working for at the time, I don't think he particularly cared about it one way or the other. And it was right around that time that, you know, I got um, PTI. And PTI was a, um, oh, it was a life changer. I mean, you know, I look back at it now, and I, I now realize that it was of much greater consequence in my life than I imagined at the time. Because at the time when I did it, the first contract, by the way, just stop me if I'm rambling, but the first contract that Mike and I got was a three-year contract. We had two years guaranteed and a third year at ESPN's option. And I thought, we're not even going to last 30 days. I mean, nobody's going to look at us. We are uh, clowns. So let's just, you know, let's just get as much money as we can because we're getting out of here. And so I kept with the newspaper, and even in then in my mind, and I was doing newspapers radio and TV at the same time. And in my mind, my mindset was still newspaper sports writer. And within a very short time, with, within a year or two, I realized that's done. That's done. You may, you may try to continue doing it, but you're done with it. So My theory is people have a certain built-in creativity within them. And if that shifts to something else and they're getting their fix from that something else, it makes it hard to do the original thing. So if your only option to have your voice be heard had been that column, I, I bet you would have kept writing it and kept trying to reinvent it and stuff like that. But PTI is so much fun to do and you're on PTI every day saying the same things you probably would have said in a column. So why do the column? Well, what I, what I learned was, I mean, and I, what I'm going to say now, I wholeheartedly believe, and some will disagree, I believe that columnists are born and not made. I believe there is a voice that good columnists have that comes from within, and it's just naturally out there. And maybe, like me, you were the class clown in school or whatever it was, you were always a columnist waiting to happen. Yeah. And I had to wait. I mean, I worked at newspapers that didn't give columns to people in their 20s. I mean, that's really not how it worked. I worked at Newsday and the New York Times and the Washington Post. And you had to prove that you had that column voice in you. Right. Now what I find, Bill, is that voice is still there, but the columns I write are on radio and starting Tuesday on podcast, and, and writing the leads, um, which is the only printed stuff we have on PTI, as you well know. That is the beginning of your column, the lead-in question. And then the first two or three things you say – that's your column on the air. It's not written, uh, you know, and it's shorter and it's not as nuanced as you would do in print and you can't labor over it and work it three or four times. Whatever comes out, comes out. But that's your column now. Don't you feel that way? Yeah, and I also think, I think it's a little less fun to write a sports column than it used to be because... And, and Why? Well, I think... In your day, definitely, and I, I was on both ends of it during, you know, I was, I was, I had a column in college, and then I had a column on my old website, and then at ESPN started in 2001 on, and I could feel it changing. I think Twitter was the big, the big thing that kind of shifted it, where 
especially in your day. And then I got, I got into it a little bit and then it changed, but, um, you argued a point and it, yeah. was, it was almost like you were a defense attorney or a prosecutor. And you're like, here's my point. I'm going to argue this shit out of it. I'm going to make it really entertaining. And it didn't have to be a hundred percent, right? You were selling it. So if you're selling a point of Dan Snyder will never win a Super Bowl as the Redskins owner. That's what you wrote. Now, I think over the last six, seven, eight years, I think because the hot take culture is people have had so much fun with that because there's so many people online and other places that they'll take somebody's piece and they'll pick it apart and they'll write the opposite side. I think people are much more careful now. And when they write pieces, and you could argue that this is much better. I mean, it certainly led to a smarter uh, evolution of the column because they're much more balanced. And I think um, I found in my own writing, my stuff became much more balanced starting in 2008, 2009, where I stopped like trying to argue sides and try to present both sides of the case, things like that. But at the same time, I kind of miss just writing those columns where you just said something crazy and tried to defend it. Like nobody does that anymore. And if you do it, so you get saying, excoriated. If, if I understand this correctly, you're saying there's a built-in fear mechanism that brings people back to the center because they're afraid of being picked apart. I know when, when I sat down to write a column, not a game column, you yeah. know, when I sat down to write a thought column, I remember writing one telling Adam Oates, if you don't like it here in Washington, get out and don't let the door hit you on the way out and get out today. I don't want to see you anymore. And right. I remember being taught and absorbing it, that to write a really good column, you had to be smart enough to know exactly what the other side would say, and you had to have arguments to diffuse it. Yeah. Because if you didn't have those, you could eventually look stupid. So that was, that was my fear factor. And, and I don't know if you did this, but, and a lot of writers don't. I appreciated editing more than most of my colleagues. Mm. I sought editing, I sought an editor who knew me, who understood what my strengths and weaknesses were and got me away from my weaknesses and, and into the sweet spot area. Yeah, I, I actually think it's probably better now. I, I just think it's led to, there's a sameness with a lot of the writing now. And I think the choices are somewhat safer that the old school columnists where they would have, like that column you just said that you would have written about Adam Oates. Yeah. I don't think people... It. I don't think people really write those columns the same way anymore. They would be like, well, maybe you should get at it. You know what I mean? They would couch it. And then the other thing that happens that I've noticed is like with social media and stuff, they put, they put your entire argument in the headline because they're trying to get people to click on it. And everyone does it like the ringer does it. So you'll say yeah. Adam Oates should get out of town. That would actually be the headline of the column. When I was growing up and especially like, you know, the first, I don't know, 10, 12 years of when I wrote, you didn't give away what the premise of the column was in the column. There'd be a little bit of mystery to it. And that, that has also changed. Now it's just Adam Oates well, should get out. And now I, I kind of yeah. know what I'm getting when I'm clicking on it. Does it make sense? Yeah, that would bother me. One of the things that I held out for um, whenever I wrote columns, and I didn't get this, but I held out for the ability to put to write the headline myself. Because much as you're saying... I didn't want to give away the store early on. And plus, I wanted you to read me. I, I will tell you that the single greatest thrill I've ever had in newspapers, ever in my life, and this goes back a long time, and a lot of people listening to this don't even read newspapers at all. But when I worked for the New York Times, one of the editions that came out in the New York Times was a very early edition. It came out at about 8 o'clock at night, day of, you know? I mean, yeah or maybe 9 o'clock at night or something like that. And I remember the Sunday newspaper in particular, much of it was ready to go on Saturday. And the New York Times Sunday newspaper is a real big deal and remains the best newspaper in the world as far as I'm concerned. And I was once, I lived on Long Island, uh, I grew up on Long Island, and I was taking a late train home from Madison Square Garden and somebody was reading my work on the seat in front of me, reading my work. This was the most thrilling thing in the world. And, and I wanted to say to this person, who I obviously didn't even know, because he's scanning the, for the dress page of the sports section, and he's reading me. And I want to say out loud, go to the jump. 
It gets better. Go to the jump. Go inside to D12. It's better. And he went in on his own. I just thought that was, that was so thrilling. The, like, we do radio. We do TV. We do podcasts. We know there's an audience, but, but it's an unseen audience, and you don't know who it is. With a newspaper, you could, I'm sure you've been in this circumstance, you watch somebody read your work. Thrilling, isn't it? Thrilling. Yeah. I remember in college, our newspaper would come out on Fridays, and we'd go to like the lunch in the cafeteria, and the papers would be all around and be watching people read the back page where I come. I was like, oh, this is cool. He's reading me. You know, and, and I, don't, I don't think that feeling probably never fades away, I'm guessing. Uh, it's totally thrilling. I mean, awards, eh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> what? <laughs> but, like, immediate impact, it's so cool. It really is cool. But I miss that, that. I do miss that. With that said, the right kind of column, I still think, can be really powerful. And I, I think one of the differences that, that is the case now is people are way less prone to take big chances with the format of the column. And there's a certain sameness to the way people write them. Whereas, you know, what my first favorite columnist was Ray Fitzgerald at the Boston Globe. I don't know if you knew him. Sure, sure. Um, and we had him and Lee Montville at the same time. But Ray, Ray was first, and then Lee Montville showed up like, probably halfway through when Ray was the columnist. But Ray would just kind of experiment within the framework of it. And he'd have fake, you know, he'd write a whole column that was just a fake script. Or a whole column in the second person or... He just would go all over the place with it. And I, I, it seems like people are more afraid to do that now because if it doesn't work, you just get skewered. And, yeah. and I, so I, people I'll default to the safe somebody, essay. Well, I look, I grew, up, I grew up in New York, Long Island, so I read you know, Larry Merchant when he was in the Post and Stan Isaacs um, at Newsday and um, Dick Young in the Daily News and you know, Red and Dave. Now, Red Smith and Dave Anderson at the Times. I mean, I'm very conversant with them. I know all the Globe writers. I knew all the Inquirer writers. I knew all the L.A. Times writers. I knew who I loved and why I loved them. And you're, you're right about people not taking chances. But every once in a while, you get a true stylist. And I'll, my example now is Sally Jenkins. Yeah. I mean, Sally will take the... Sally killed in Rio. She killed she was absolutely great, and, and look at the bloodlines, obviously, Dan Jenkins, but Sally can be funny, she can be mean, she loves to write the columns that essentially says, and says literally, but what do I know? I'm just a stupid woman, and you know, women don't know anything about sports. Right. Those are her greatest columns, and she'll turn, if you're talking about Fitzgerald, Sally will turn styles around, it's not always the same, and, and after a while, when you've written thousands of these things, a reader, I think, appreciates somebody trying something. So she destroyed Goodell in the, yes, in she the did. Deflake age. Time and time and time again. Time again. On the Brady issue, she's been she's been the greatest voice in print. I think. I yeah, do. and what I like about it is, unlike me, where I'm actually probably biased because I'm a Patriot fan, although I've I'd been killing Goodell for years before that. But she really, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, yeah, you? yeah. No, really? it's true. Yeah, it's apparently. <laughs> um, but she was unbiased. She's in Washington. What does she care if Tom Brady That's doesn't right. play? She was just crushing Goodell because he was doing something wrong, and she and she felt strongly about it. And you know, I I I think those types of columns, which I did you how much of the Kaepernick stuff did you read the last few days? Did you read any of it? Or I will you tell you it? honestly, I've been I've been out of town. I've been in Delaware. I've been playing golf, and I have not read much, if if anything. I've watched some television stuff, and then I've, you know, I've I haven't read. What who's doing well? Well, what's what's funny is, or not funny, um, interesting, I guess, is it's the classic, classic, classic sports topic where you can take one side or the other and go really, really far with it, you know, and if you believe in the flag. And you just believe the flag trumps everything, you can go that whole direction. Doesn't mean you're right. If you believe that uh, the flag represents freedom and and everything Kaepernick did came out of what the flag represents, you can go that whole side. And then there's all these little subdivisions to it. I was of the side of, you know, I I thought the message that he was trying to send was way more important than you know, what, what people 
were arguing on the other side that you just have to stand up. Like he, the whole point of the flag is it represents freedom and the whole reason that we love this country and we live here. And he was standing, you know, sitting down for that basically. But he, there was, there was a genuine reason he did it. And I thought he really explained it well. I thought what he yeah, said I, after was eloquent and, and it was just hard to say that he wasn't doing it for reasons that really meant something to him. That was my takeaway. I haven't talked about it, and I'm happy to talk about it with we you because to. I haven't been on PTI, uh, you know, and I don't know that we'll get to it. But I will tell you that the, the, the most disappointing thing is when people take the following position. Well, he has a right to do it. Well, that's not in dispute. There's no disputing that. So don't, don't tell me you're being smart when you say he has a right to do it. Right. Having, having been old, and one of the great advantages about being old is that you've seen this sort of thing before in cycles. I mean, you've seen oh, yeah. uh, Carlos and Smith, and you've seen Abdul Rauf, and you've seen you know, the, the, the various protests. As I get older, and I know that a lot of people don't like him, but as I get older, I sort of find myself agreeing more and more with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in almost everything he says. <laughs> He's been amazing. He wrote the best piece about this. This is, this is bothersome to me. I mean, Kareem and I are about, I think we're the same age, and, and he comes from the New York area and all of that. And I know that, like, a lot of writers never liked him. I got along with him fine, and I know that the Laker people didn't like him. And, and you know, nobody likes him, and he never got hired. And I always knew he was smart. And yeah. when I listen to him, I think, wow, he's got it. My, my sense of this is you've got to separate the message from the messenger and you've got to understand that this, this, in fact, this is the cornerstone of democracy in America, social protest. It's the cornerstone of it. Yeah. I mean, everybody talks about the 60s. I know what that was about. There's a great risk on Kaepernick's part. I, the one, I mean, I'm not sure he's the right guy only in this sense. I don't know that he's a leader on his team. I don't know that he has the stature. I mean, he doesn't have the stature of Jim Brown and Bill Russell and and Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, he doesn't have that. But come on here. Come on. This is a great risk on his part. And the message, you may not like the messenger. You may not like the tactic. Nobody ever likes the tactic of social protest. But what he's saying uh, in general makes a lot of sense. I, I would argue I would argue the police issue. I, you know, I'd sort well, of that, argue the, police the part blanket wasn't great. terms. Yeah. You know what I mean, Bill? The blanket terms. I don't yeah. like that. But I think you and I are probably aligned on this one, right? 100%. And what yeah. I liked about it is it was peaceful. It was meant, yeah. to, it was meant to provoke discussion, and it certainly yeah. did. And I, and I really think, you know, I get the flag thing. That, that's why this was a great story. Because if somebody's going to just say, look, I, the flag is the most important thing here, and, and it stands for something, and I, we, nobody is ever going to get me off this corner— I respect it. I just don't agree with it. Um, I think what bothered some people a little bit was that th the motivations that he might have had. I thought his motivations were, were probably the right motivations. I don't know for sure, but I feel like they were. I don't know the guy. Um, but he is, a, he is somebody that had a chance of getting cut, who's had a really up and down career. Um, I, I think what bothered people was that Maybe they wanted somebody to do this or something like it, just not this guy. And I did yeah, feel like I know, that I was part of this. That. You know, like, like if you looked at if this was done by, for example, um, and and without getting involved in the sort of racial politics of this, so I'll name a white player and a black player. Yeah. If this was done by either Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson, I think it would be different. I do. Yeah. And if uh, um, and if instead so. of uh, in the late '60s. If if not Ali getting stripped but for the for the title for refusing to fight in Vietnam, if it had been Jimmy Young, I don't think it, it would have had the same meaning, you know. And and I do think I think people would be foolish to say that's not part of it. That this is a guy that has has come off two straight, not very good seasons. He's been erratic. Of course, they, that's part of it. You know, um, but th that there's unquestionably that's part of it. And the flag, and you're 100 percent right. The flag is, you know, it is the literal wrapping oneself in the flag that people talk about. You remember what happened with Rick Monday? Yeah. When he saw somebody burning a flag. And, and, and that flag is the most powerful symbol of the United States of America. But as you say, you can argue persuasively 
that that flag itself is what gives this license and why this is so important. So, you know. It, I'll tell you this. We're taping this on Thursday afternoon, West Coast time. This story has now been going on for four four days, and he's playing in a preseason game. It'll go through the weekend. It might go through next week. This is going to have one of the longest tails, and I think it's – it's great. I love I love talking about stuff like this. I love debates like this, and especially I've been kind of waiting for an athlete. You know, we saw it at the ESPYS with these guys when they got up on stage, and respect to them for what they did. They didn't really say anything. They they came out. They said some stuff. I thought it took courage on their part to even throw their hats in the ring. Nothing really changed. The debate kind of came and went. I was like, oh, look at what these guys did. Then it kind of came and went. Carmelo, I think his heart's in the right place. He really seems to be pushing for towards something, but hasn't really figured out how to get there. And in this one simple thing that Kaepernick did, it kind of launched the debate and the discussion that all of these guys wanted. Now, that it, now it's gone in a, all these different directions, but it's weird that he would, that Kaepernick was the one that that really ignited it. I would have assumed it was going to be Carmelo. I thought Carmelo might do something on the gold medal stand. I didn't know what he was going to do. Hmm. I mean, to me, the it's immediately people. If LeBron had done it, and LeBron was involved in Trayvon Martin, yeah. And if LeBron had done it, um, it would have it would have civilized the debate in a different way. I agree. Because no matter what you think, you, you have to understand LeBron James is one of the two or three most important sports figures in the country. And Colin Kaepernick is not, which is why if you choose to dismiss him at the moment, you can. But, but I, you know, my sense of this was that, um, wow, yeah, risky, risky on his part. So yeah. if, if you had had PTI this week, what – what happens? Do you and Wilbon, would you... Oh, Mike and I do this um, repeatedly. You I do it think. all week, I mean, first right? We... Yeah, you do. I mean, the first day, it's what do you think. The second day, it's what do you think of the reaction among the players. Right. The third day is what's going to happen to Kaepernick. Uh, and the fourth day, you go backwards and you say it's been out here for a while. And, you know, and our great producers, Eric Rideholm and Matt Kelleher, would frame questions to get us back into it day after day after day. And I think, I can't speak for Mike, and I haven't talked to him in a few days. We haven't talked about that. I haven't talked about this with anybody, but I would think he'd have an appetite for it. Yeah. I really do. I, would, I, I would think say, he would. This is in Uncle yeah. Mike's wheelhouse. There's no question. Yeah, I think so. It also, the other good thing with this saga, just from a content standpoint, was you knew a couple people were going to make jackasses out of themselves during the course of it. And, of course, that happened, too. So it really was the full well, but, gamut. You know, I mean, that, that's a given with almost everything. Yeah, you know, the Rodney, the Rodney Harrison was an all-time, all-time boner. But you, you knew you were going to have those with this. Hey, you have a podcast coming up, but you don't have a I name for it? Mention. Or you do? No, we were going to call it The Ringer, uh, and, then, <laughs> and then it was copyrighted. Um, it's the Tony Kornheiser Show. It's, uh, it starts Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, day after Labor Day, which is when everything really starts in America in terms of sports, because football's back and it's the most important sport, pro and college by far. Are you gonna have um, Are you gonna have ads on this podcast? I think we're gonna you have, have to have ads. The, can I explain a couple of things to you or your audience that you already know? Wait, hold on. Let me. Um, do, I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to say hello to one of our sponsors, and you can you can hear what it's like to integrate ahead, a sponsor into a, a lively, fantastic conversation. I want to tell you about NFLSundayTicket.tv. So I've had DirecTV, I think, since 1999. And I got it to get all the football games on Sunday. And I was renting an apartment in Charlestown. I wasn't supposed to have the satellite, but I got it anyway. And I hope the guy would never notice. And all of a sudden, I was watching all these football games. So now fast forward to 2016. You can now stream NFL Sunday Ticket on NFLSundayTicket.tv which is great because some people can't get DirecTV where they live. Now you can watch football games on Sunday without a satellite for just $49.99 a month. Stream games using your favorite device. And if you're a college student, there's an exclusive deal. You get NFL Sunday ticket for only $24.99 a month. And right now, our listeners get 10% off when using the promo code RINGER, your favorite name. 
So go to NFLSundayTicket.tv and use promo code RINGER right now. And now back to Tony's podcast. So you didn't call it the Tony That was Corner? a very good live read. I Thank think you. one of my sponsors may be actually Underpants. Underpants. I'm sure I'm going to have to do a live read on that. Oh, we have we have MeUndies coming later. You can you can stay I for think, the MeUndies lead. I think they're going to be a sponsor. Oh, I was told that today. Yeah, so I'm going to do that. Let um, me tell you, you're the big winner there. You get because they'll send you underwear. All I do is wear MeUndies. Who wants to buy underwear when they're sending it to you? It's fantastic. Well, I think there's. I think we also can I mention this on the air? Yeah. I think we also have Blue Apron and. Oh, I'm we have Blue Apron. That. Yeah, but we we yeah because done... that's food. It's food, it's delicious, and we've done uh, dozens of Blue Apron spots on the ring. Okay, yeah. so the I live reads got, are fun. Well, I've done I've done a couple of live reads. I do a window nation ad um, when I was on regular radio. But I'm, give me thirty seconds to, to spiel on the podcast. I wanted to give you like uh, three but, minutes. Explain. Can you oh, go great. backwards okay, and explain? Okay, so it starts Tuesday. Yeah, but explain how you how this happened. You, so you had a radio okay. show on Washington since eighteen seventy six. When was the first day of the radio uh, show? Since uh, Martin Van Buren. Yeah. Martin Van Buren. I've, you got in a feud with him, and then they, no, then it went from there. No, I you, didn't know. See, that's my mo everywhere else that I got in a feud. I actually didn't get in a feud. With I had Van two Buren? years left on my contract. <laughs> no, I'm I, doing something insane. No, I I was joking that you got in a feud with Martin Van Buren, not with the not oh, with the radio. Oh, I thought you stage. meant with with. Oh no 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 I, no. no uh, I, we went to high school together. We you, were great. We were pals. You, Old Tinder hook. You and I, um, we've talked about your future audio plans for a couple years. You wanted to make the leap yeah. into podcasting. You were yeah. you were getting tired of the radio grind, and yeah. I think it's the right move. I think it's smart. You're going to do it for like about an hour every day, Monday through Friday. Yes, an hour a day. It's going to be it's going to be just like the radio show that I did. It's going to have sports and pop culture and politics, and we're going to have the same regular people who are my friends, who are very smart. It's a smart and funny adult talk show, and we're going to do it. And, and I think there's a lot of motivational factors here, but uppermost in my mind was the fact that I stayed on newspapers and watched them die under me, you know? Yeah. And, and I got the sense from my son and from everybody in that era who were like 35 and down that they don't, they don't have appointments anymore that they get this stuff when they want to get it, that the fact that you're on every day from 10 to 12 means nothing to them. If they can't get it in their hands, that it's video on demand and it's audio on demand, and your listeners should know this, that I think you'll run audio in America within the next two to three years because <laughs> you're the smartest guy out there. And I felt I wanted to do it. I wanted to own my own content. And the really good news for me is that I left two years of, of significant dollars on the table as an employee, and now I'm the employer, and I will make no money and will pay people. <laughs> so it's a fantastic career move at my age. Fantastic. Well, you'll but you'll be able to get some sponsors, and the podcast yeah, will do well. Yeah, underpants and be, food. You'll be fine. Who doesn't need that? Come yeah. on, underpants Pe and food. People the need underpants. They need of life. They need all the stuff. No, I think it's going to do yeah. well, and I think it was the right move. And I like that. You know, you've a couple times in your career, you've you've zigged a little when it was the right time to zig, and this this feels well, like I one told of them. You, I think I've told you this. What, um, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest newspaper editor of all time, Benjamin Crown Shield Bradley, yeah. proper Bostonian, he yeah told me or didn't tell me, but was quoted as saying. He was quoted as saying that when you reach the age of 55 mm -hmm. and you get a job offer that scares you, take it. Like that you gotta, if you lose the ability to take risks because you've just gotten sort of staid and old, that's deadly and you, and, and you should try new things and so I'm doing it. Yeah, I do think that in general there's a fear of failure, especially as you get older and older. And you just yeah. kind of default to whatever the whatever the safe thing is. So I'm glad you're doing this. You mentioned Ben Bradley. I was just watching all the President's Men for the 738th time because I just great. get sucked in. It holds in. up. It's great. I just get sucked in, and Robards is so good in that as Ben Bradley. And I was watching the Sally Perfect. the Sally Quinn scene when she knows I forget the guy's name. Somebody who's involved who has info on the Watergate stuff, and she'd had drinks with them. And Redford's like, "Do you think?" Do you think uh, 
do you think he invited you up there to go to bed with you? And she gets mad at him. Do you remember this part with Sally Quinn? I remember that part in the movie. I, I'm because I know everybody. You know, I, I mean, I know them all. I know Bob and I know Carl, and of course, I knew Ben. It's just hard for me to separate the actors from um, the people. Well, it, but it is. It's hard. I will. Here's I will tell my you point, though. Robots, she, she, mar- Sally Quinn ended up marrying Ben Bradley like three years after that movie. Well, they, yeah, I mean, it's one of the great romances and marriages in history. I know, and, I, really and I'd is. forgotten that. So now when I watch all the, it kind of screws up all the presidents, been like a tiny bit for me. Let me tell you a, a story about how I got to the Washington Post. Please do. Um, I was recruited at the time in the late 70s. The sports editor was George Solomon, and he hired some of the greatest people who ever worked in sports in America. The style editor was Shelby Coffey, who went on to become the editor of the Los Angeles Times, among other places, and is now running the museum in Washington, D.C. And they invited my wife and I down to Washington for dinner, you know, to sort of seal the deal. Yeah. And we, you know, we went out, and so it's George and his wife, Hazel, and Shelby and his wife, Mary Lee, one of the first female orthopedic surgeons in America. And we get to this restaurant, and I think the restaurant is called Romeo and Juliet, and we get it's not existent anymore. And we get to the restaurant and we notice that it's a table for eight and not a table for six. And at that moment, Ben and Sally walk in and Bill, I, I'd, have, I'd have paid them to work there. <laughs> they walked in on rose petals and foam. It was like it was like a scene from a Gene Kelly movie when he starts to dance. I was totally hooked. These are, in my mind, Ben Bradley and Sally Quinn in the late 70s are not only the greatest couple in journalism, to me, they're the greatest people in journalism. I'm just stunned by it. And as they say in Jerry Maguire, they had me at hello. Yeah. (laughs) What a great decade to be in Washington. I mean, could more stuff have happened that decade? I left the New York Times, which nobody does. Yeah. And I left the New York Times to go to the Washington Post, which was risky at the time. Worked out great for me. Worked out great. I have no regrets on it. But but this was in the post-Watergate blush period and it was great to be in washington then just no matter what you did no matter where you worked you could have worked for any newspaper in the country to be in washington then that was the best place i have some a couple rapid fire questions for you that aren't that rapid are you going to get me in trouble no i'm not going to get you in trouble at all can we talk about the night of at some point Yeah, that that was uh, that was in the semi-rapid fire Okay, go what do you got um I haven't spent time with uh, with Wilbon in I don't know two years. He, yeah, he was. It's funny physically he doesn't age, but he he becomes grumpier and grumpier as an old man. I think like by three years for every year. How grumpy is is he right now? What's the level well, of grumpiness? That's, but that's the whole thing. That's yeah. um. That's Walter Matthau. It's grumpy old men. I mean, Mike can never be as old as I am, so he's going to outgrumpify me if he possibly can. <laughs> so he has outgrumpified And no matter what him. happens, he yells about two things no matter what, even if they're not on the table. <laughs> analytics. <laughs> even if you do simple math, if yeah. you're doing two and two is four, go, analytics. And he yells about millennials. I hate millennials. <laughs> but he hated Uber, and now all he'll take is Uber black. If we're waiting outside... He said, I'm not, no, I'm not getting in a Toyota Avalon. Get out of here. We're going Uber black. We're going big or we're going home. So he does that all the time. I can't believe he uses Uber. That's the most stunning revelation I've had he in does. Like 50 podcasts. He loves to call it. He loves to hit the button and he go, look at this. There's three of them within three blocks. <laughs> he loves it. He loves it. <laughs> one, yeah. of the, one of the best things about Wilbon was his ability to, no matter how expensive his suit was, whatever that he was wearing and how messy the meal was that you, that you were eating. Like when we would do a countdown, like between halftime and whatever, he would never get food on his clothes. Ever. His clothes are much too important and expensive ever. I don't know how he did it, but he would be eating like 150 pair of shoes. I know he does. He would be eating like spaghetti. It's splashing everywhere. And it was like he had this like suit of armor, not on him. invisible suit of armor. It would just never. Meanwhile, no, he's I'm like, got he's he's. Yeah, you're right. He's wrapped in invisible saran wrap. Nothing gets on him. What? ever. Nothing. And his collars are perfect. 
Nobody has perfect collars like Wilbon. Nobody in the world. Perfect. All well, the time. Wilbon impressed this upon me when we were doing TV that the single most important part of an outfit when you're on television and you have to turn left and right is the rigidity of the collar and the collar's <laughs> ability to move with the neck versus like either flopping over or being too hard so it sticks in your neck. You got to find the middle ground. Uncle he's, Mike. He's totally perfect on collars all the time. All the time, no matter what the shirt is. So you guys are still is. getting Even along? Shirts, What's which it? have it's, soft collars. It's been like, mm -hmm. what, it's been like, how long have you guys been together now? You get, you, you're like literally the, the old phrase of you guys are like an old married couple. You literally are an old married couple. There's no question we are. Of course, not only have we been, we've been doing PTI for 15 full now. It's amazing. But we worked together at the post starting in 1979 and 1980. We're, we're never, a, we're never apart. I mean, we're, we're apart, but. I know exactly what he's thinking. He knows exactly what I'm thinking. He knows how to press the buttons that drive me crazy, and I can do the same to him. Sure, of course. What drives him the most crazy about you? Um, probably uh, rigidity. You know, and let's start. Let's go now. Come on. This is the time to go. I, I mean, I am, I am not just on time. I am early, and he is not just fashionably late. He's he is late. really late. So that drives me crazy, and yeah. he knows it, and he does it deliberately. Of course he does. And what I would do deliberately to him is find any way in the world to try and insult Northwestern or Chicago every time I can to try and just take them down, take shots at them. You know, so I'll do that. Where does he stand on Derrick Rose now? Because he was like the last Derrick Rose defender, and he bled Derrick Rose, and now Derrick Rose is on a New York team. So has he abandoned Derrick Rose, or how has he come to grips with that? I don't, you know, my guess is that he hasn't, that he wishes him well, that he understood, he understood it was time to go in Chicago. I mean, even he at the end was, he could not defend anything Derrick Rose ever said, so he would take the position, oh, don't even listen to him. And I'd go, Mike, but he's standing at a microphone, and he wants to be heard. You can't take the position that he's actually not saying anything consequential. You have to talk about what he says. But I, th I just, I figure, I think what, what hurt Wilbon, I, I don't know how much he would, he would talk about this, but I think he really liked Thibodeau. He yeah. really did. But he knew that Thibodeau, like Billy Martin with a pitching staff, was killing his players. And, and, and so he was really ambivalent about it. Like, he knew he had to be fired, but no matter who replaced him, he was going to hate him, and he does. Yeah. And he does. So, What's, yeah. But he's, he's got to be out of his mind with the Cubs right now, though. Well, he's, he's, doing, he's doing that Wilbon thing. That Wilbon thing is to deny that they're any good, is to brace yourself for disaster, to predict mm, disaster. It's a great move. To say, even though he says that Madden, he used to rip Theo Epstein. He killed him on the air when Theo worked for the Red Sox. He killed him. And I would say, look what this guy's done. He's, 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 who's he? He's nobody. He gets to the Cubs, and now Theo Epstein is the greatest executive in the history of baseball. He loves Madden, he, you know, and probably always loved Madden. But he'll say, oh, you know, Rizzo's not that great or, or you know, their pitching isn't that great or what's happening to Lester's arm because he wants them to win so badly that he's afraid if he gets out in front of that and they lose that it's crushing. But if you ask him, you know, like, do you want to play golf? Let's play golf on this particular Saturday. And he'll go, well, i got to find out what the Cubs' playoff schedule is. Like, it's like he's on the team. It's like, you know, he's got to go to every game. He's got to be there. He is, even in our business, his fandom is almost remarkable. I mean, it really is to me. He loves them. Yeah, it's loves funny. Them. I always took shit for being a Boston fan, and Wilbon was doing the same stuff on PTI before my column even became like a well-known column. He, was, he well, always the owned the Chicago that, thing. The thing that I don't understand, and I cannot tolerate it, it's very simple. I grew up in New York, and when I was very young, there were three baseball teams, but there was always two of everything. Yeah. And you had to pick the team you liked, and you had to hate the other one. Or if you didn't hate the other one, you had to be at least indifferent. When the, when the White Sox do well, Wilbon says he's a White Sox fan. I, I, I don't know how you can do that. I don't know how you can do it. That's, so. I don't understand that either. There, there's some L.A. basketball fans that flip back and forth between the Clippers and the Lakers, and I'm just confused no, you can't. by them. I don't understand... 
how that even happens. Um, no, that's not. That's wrong. When you guys started you pick PTI, the one you want you live and die with them. When you guys started PTI, how I remember one of those early shows ended up online at some point. It was fascinating to watch. How long? How many shows did you do before you felt like the show that it eventually became? Like you, you kind of knew like, oh, this is it. We've figured it out. I. I, I can't answer that because it's so long ago and I don't know, and it occurs to me that I thought it was really good from the beginning. But I can tell you this, that when we started, I think maybe we did one practice show or two practice shows, not, not more than that, and maybe only one. And Mike and I had come out of the tradition of the Sunday morning show with Dick Schaap, the sports right. reporters. Okay, so that was what we were used to on television. And we did this show with Ride Home. And Ride Home was inventing television with us. You know, we were, we were the drivers of the car. He was the designer of the car. Every single thing that went into the car was Eric Ride Home and then Matt Kelleher. And after the first show, I think Mike said, we got to slow this down. We got to have more exchange. And I looked at him and I said, see that guy over there? That kid knows what he's doing. Mm. Let's get faster. And that was the key to all of it. That was the key to all of it. The, the stuff on the screen, the bells and the whistles, all of that, the key to it was let's move. And as a consequence of that, I d didn't go back to sports reporters, really, because it, the pace was really different for me. I, I, it's like I felt, and I love sports reporters. I love Joe Valerio. I love the history of that show. And I was on the original um, pilot for that show with Dave Anderson and Mike Lupica and Willie McDonough. And I was on the original pilot, but I, it was like, it, it was like I went from a horse to a car, you know, right. and, you, and you put, you put your foot down and it went so fast and it was thrilling. And we weren't nearly as fast as I guess other people. I mean, I, I think when, when Levitard does the show, you know, it's really fast. When you did the show, it was fast. It was hard for me to keep up with you. You were fast. I was so. psyched that I came back last, Mar last March, and I had had so many TV. I'd never done PTI with you when I had had enough TV reps because I had my first TV I ever did, I think, was on PTI with you, and you carried me for four days, which I've always appreciated. Um, um, I, I'm sure I didn't, I'm sure I didn't no, carry you at all. No, you 100% carried me. And then I did a couple more times and then I was doing it from that closet at LA Live and I hated it because yeah. you were on a half second delay and I just, yeah. I never wanted to do it unless I was in the room with you. And then I did Countdown for two years and I did the Grand Lone Basketball Hour and I got, I got just a ton of reps and I was really excited to go back because I knew at that point I was probably leaving and I was like, I, I won't really want to go back and do PTI with Tony one more time. And I came back and it was so much fun to do that show when you actually kind of know what you're doing on TV versus when you're terrified yeah. and just kind of being led by the back of your head the whole time. The, the, the two really smart things about the format, one is that because, because of the time limit for each subject, nobody can filibuster. You can't just talk for a minute and a half because you're literally screwing over the other guy. So you That's have right. to do. You, you have got to you do, gotta go back and forth. You, you gotta have give the, it back. You have the prompter read. You you throw it to the other guy. He says his point for like 30, 35 seconds. Throws it back to you. You counter, and now it's just a race to fit in as much as you can before you hear that bell, which is the second part of the genius of the show. Which is because that clock is coming, you you end up you go faster because you want to jam stuff in. But that actually makes for great TV, and and I then boom, you're off to the next you. one. I can't tell you how many people over the years have said to me about the show, one of the reasons I like the show is because I know that even if I don't like the topic you're talking about, I see what's next, and I see the clock, and yeah. I know you're going to be done. One time, I think, on the show, Mike went on and on and on, and he finally finished, and there was, about, there was no 10 seconds left in the segment. I said, oh, do I work here too? Is it my turn? <laughs> you know? And the relationship that we have, we've been co-workers and friends it's 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 i don't know since what it's 35 36 years i mean people talk about chemistry 
Yeah. And there's that, there's that old line, the guy goes to Wimbledon for the first time, and he looks at the grass courts of Wimbledon, and he says, my God, they're green. How do you get them this green? And the answer is you start with 5,000 years of rain. Wilbon and I knew each other so well before we ever did this show. And that, that's the key to it. Yeah, and it's also why you you guys are so careful about who the guest hosts are because it's got to be somebody that fits into that at least a little bit. You have to have well, yeah, some I mean, sort of foundation. I, mean, I, have this, I have this terrible fear that I'm so old and some of the people with me are young. I have this fear about Pablo, about Pablo Torre, who's yeah. really smart, yeah, really smart and really interesting and says things on the air that you, that you go, you back up and go, ooh, I, I had never thought of that. But I figured that I look like his grandfather, hmm. and yet Eric and Matt say that the reaction on social media is fine, and nobody says that at all. They like the show. so. Yeah, I remember a year ago, you were like, I, they say Pablo would be good, but I can't go on with him. I'm, I look like I'm his grandfather. I'm taking him to the yeah. mall. Yeah, it's too, yeah. You said yeah. I was like the yeah. lowest you'd go for age. Like mid, mid-40s mid was the lowest you'd go. Yeah, I mean, cause, because you, it, there's such a sort of striking... There's such a sort of striking difference, and, you, and I worry about that. But at my age now, I, I can't worry about it. I mean, because i got to celebrate being a, being a geezer. i got to <laughs> celebrate that. Yeah. Hold on, we got to take one more quick break. All right, let's talk about headspace. Most problems begin in your head, whether it's stress, depression, fear, sleeplessness. They start in your mind, and then they worm their way into the rest of your life. Well, did you know you could just change that in 10 minutes a day with meditation? That's where the Headspace app comes in. Headspace is meditation made simple. There's a mountain of science showing the positive effects of mindfulness. The Headspace app provides guided meditations you can use whenever you want, wherever you want, on your phone, computer, or tablet. These sessions focus on everything from dealing with stress and, stress and depression to helping you eat more mindfully or even to get you to sleep easier. It's 1% of your day that can change the other 99%. You should definitely try this. I gotta say, it's pretty good. Uh, download the Headspace app. Start your journey toward a happier, healthier life. Again, 10 minutes. 10 minutes a day. Learn more at headspace.com slash BS. And Tony mentioned underwear earlier. Well, we are coming up on my one-year anniversary with MeUndies. We launched this podcast in October 2015. This is podcast tw- uh, 121. And we passed 60 million listeners i think last week so pretty amazing um and thanks for everybody that spread the word and supported the podcast and everything and thanks to everybody that's helped out with sponsorships and all the partnerships we had including me and so i think has been on here as many times as anyone um and not only that but they send me underwear and i wear it and it's fantastic every pair of me undies is made from sustainably sourced modal a fabric that's three times softer than cotton. Once you try them on, you'll understand why MeUndies has the rep as the world's most comfortable underwear. They have dozens of styles, limited edition prints, um, boxers, trunks, thongs, bikinis. If you don't like your first pair of MeUndies, they are free. Go to MeUndies.com slash BS for 20% off your first order plus free shipping. That's MeUndies.com slash BS. Back to Tony. Um, yeah, I think... You and I have talked about this a lot off the air, but I, I just don't think people understand how important chemistry is for TV, especially when it's two people, three people, four people, whatever. And I think the mentality for most of most of these networks, especially you see it with the big sports, football, basketball, baseball, is they hire the names and then they throw them together and hope it works. They don't go the other way. They don't. They don't figure out who's going to work and then put them together. And it, which was interesting, like when Kelly Ripa, when she, when uh, Regis left her show and they just had this never ending cascade of co-hosts trying to figure out who the right co-host would be instead of just hiring somebody. And eventually they settled on Strahan because she had chemistry with them and they did great. And that show did even better than the Regis thing. Then it eventually yes, turned it out did. they hated each other. But Which I didn't know because yeah, they didn't show on TV. They it, were great. They, but even if they didn't like each other off TV, they had chemistry on TV, which is which is all that really matters. And now they're going through the same guest host thing again. It's it's always interesting 
and we've seen it now where we have the football season started next week where some of the crews have gotten shaken up. I'm always fascinated to see how it works. Cause I've been on both ends of it. Like I, I had the first year I was on countdown. It was me, magic, Wilbon and Jalen. And we all liked each other. Maybe the show wasn't perfect. And I had a lot to learn about doing TV, but you know, when we were in the green room, we were talking the whole time and there was, we definitely had some form of chemistry. And then the next year it just wasn't the same. Um, but you can feel it when it's not there. And when it's like your turn, your turn, your turn, my turn, it's, it's obvious. No, I, I, I look, I always wanted, do you remember when we did that NBA draft special, that one time only thing? Yeah. 2010. That was so much okay. fun. You was you, okay, me, who Wilbon, was on and that show? Who was on that show in the same room? Who was that? Who was that cast? You, me, Wilbon, and Lebetard. And how great was that show? It was a good one. We had it right, right yeah. on. Put in the overhead camera. Yeah, remember? <laughs> so I mean, I always thought. I guess we've talked about this, but I always thought that if I was casting for ESPN, the basketball show, yeah, I would have you, me, Wilbon. And Stephen A. And I think it would have been the most interesting show that they could possibly do. It wouldn't have had coaches, and it wouldn't have had players, um, and it wouldn't have had, you know, necessarily a host, although we all could have taken turns in doing that. But I think people would have wanted to watch that show because there are no shrinking violets there, yeah. none. And, and everybody respects and likes each other enough to do that show. And I could see us afterwards, although I'd get out early because I'm tired. You'd be asleep. But I could see us going out and continuing it. I really could. Well, so I'd have done that. Especially, I, especially now in the era of Uber, now that Wilbon knows what an Uber is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been interesting to watch. I don't know if you've seen any of Stephen A. with Max, but it's like watching. It's, I, I've been fascinated by it. It's like, uh, it's like watching somebody in a new marriage. Stephen A. was with Skip for, I don't know, five or six years. More, I'll bet. Maybe I'll bet more. more, actually. And yeah. it got to the point where I think people thought that they argued all the time. They didn't really argue that much at all. Like, they, they if anything, they were they were a little too friendly. And they would just kind of exchange monologues. And and Skip, Stephen A. and Max, like, they're going at it. Like, I, I can't totally tell if they like each other or not. But it's it's very compelling. I, I've Max been interested is in really it. smart. Max is smart, man. I, I had and him Max on one of my is, test shows. He was great. He's really smart, and he knows he's really smart. Max yeah. was the original host of Around the Horn. I remember. And I spent a lot of time with Max. I am a big Max Kellerman fan, and I think, I mean, he's smart, and he's quick, and he doesn't take stuff. And I think, I think for that format, I think he's going to be great. I, I think it's the perfect choice. I really do. Yeah, it's a very, very, very interesting combination. I'll be interested to see how it plays out. It's it's a little like watching two alpha dogs on a basketball team. Good. You know, which Good. for TV that might that might be the right thing. All right, time to talk about yeah. the night of. I love I when loved you, it. I love when you get passionate about shows. I it doesn't it. happen often. Sometimes it's the wrong show. I think you were the last person who was watching Homeland. Um, and then, no, I, I, yeah, I got off Homeland a little too late and then yeah. I went back and I liked the, the second no, iteration of it. No, no. Okay. But I could no. be wrong, but I was first on the Americans. I was first. Well, and, and you might've been last. Who else is on the on Americans? Americans? Yeah. You don't like the Americans? Yeah. You guys are all in your little Americans club. All the, th love it. Throwing, love dropping the balloons but on I, each other about the Americans. You know what I loved? There was a show on HBO about five years ago that didn't even get a complete run that Dustin Hoffman was in about horse racing. I think it was called Luck. Oh, yeah, Luck. Loved yeah. it. Loved it. A couple of the horses died. Um, I think that's why they canceled it. Two horses. Yeah, Peter got mad at Luck. Peter didn't like yeah. Luck. I thought it was a great show. So Just, I get on the night of yeah. early, like second episode, and I go back to the first because I hear about it, and I love it. I mean, I love it beyond... Anything that I've watched in the last few years, I loved it even more than the first season of True Detective, which I thought was awfully good. Yeah. Uh, so are you done with this, the night of? Yeah, I finished. I watched it. Okay, good. I, I didn't want to spoil it. I watched you. it. So I, so I had, um, in hindsight... Wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. Before you do this, I, I'm going to tell the listeners that 
this will be the last thing we discuss and then we're going to go. So if you haven't finished the night of everything now, we might spoil some of this stuff. Uh, thanks for listening. This was great. Blah, blah, blah. If you have finished it, keep listening. Okay, here we go. Okay. So I get on it right away. There are characters I immediately, small characters I immediately love. I love the first lawyer. I love her. Like the Gloria Allred lawyer. Oh, yeah, yeah, love yeah. Her. Yeah. Think she was great. Love, love her right away. I love uh, the limousine driver, the scary guy, the hearse mm. driver. My God, I love the hearse driver. Small character, love him right away. Um, I thought the parents were wonderful in very, very small roles. Yeah. And the guy I like the most is the lead detective. Not John Turturro, because I've got to tell you, as much as I like John Turturro, I got tired of the feet. I got tired of it. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a little bit too much. I love the lead detective. I love the fact that as the show went on, he became less and less sure, and he worked it harder and harder and harder. So I really like that. My, um, I'll do this very quickly. My disappointment, one of my disappointments in the show was the, the method in which they got the young woman lawyer off the case at the end. Yeah. I didn't, I, that, was, that was silly to me, and it didn't, it didn't really work. I know you want to give Turturro a last shot. Okay, I see that in hindsight. And, and I, won't even, I won't even go the Martin Scorsese um, route with, with the rat at the end of The Departed and the cat walking across. I won't do that. I thought more would be made of the cat. I actually thought at some point the cat was the key, key to the whole thing. And, and the disappointment to me, the ending was sort of like, oh, I, okay, I didn't see that coming, but you didn't let me see that coming. You didn't give me an opportunity on that. So I didn't love the ending, but I really did. I really did love the show, and I loved the lead character. I thought he was great. And then Omar was in the show. Omar was, was unbelievable. Great. Yeah, my, Omar was great. So my biggest I issues know. were I thought the 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 female attorney fell apart too fast. I yeah, I can get maybe yeah. the one second kiss, but when you're smuggling heroin in your vagina, no, you can't do that. It, it was just too ridiculous for me. You can't do that, no. Um, but now, in in hindsight, Bill, we see that that was to set up John Turturro. I think the kiss could have set her up because basically they only showed the video of the kiss, and as my friend Brad said, yeah, they said, had the other. They had the, they had the other. Of course, they did. Yeah, so, as my, yeah. I'm stealing this point from my friend Brad because he said it at my fantasy football draft as he had a seven minute rant about the show. If if they have the video of that kiss, aren't they going to go back then and then watch all the other videos of her coming in? And aren't they going to see the, the, the gonna vagina have, smuggling? They're going to have the heroin found. smuggling. Yeah, of course they are. Course. Um, so I just thought the kiss could have done it. I, I still I. I know she was young and inexperienced and was only thrown on the case because of her ethnicity. Ethnicity. I have trouble saying that word. Uh, yeah. But uh, but I still don't think somebody's going to make that big of a common sense screw up. It no matter how incompetent you are. I mean, we've it's seen not going to happen. We've seen That's some incompetent TV characters. That was too much. And the other thing is, the deadlock jury. I know they happen. I just don't think the judge quits on the deadlock jury and says, all right, uh, let's throw this out. No. And that all happens even in five if, seconds. Even at 6-6, six, six, yeah. it's too convenient. You're wrapping up a series. You're wrapping up a show. It's a little too convenient for me. I did like the way they led me to believe time and time again that one of the other characters might have done it. So it was I did good. Like there was some good red hair. my phone is beeping. All right, my we're almost done. Tell I'm them to hold off. Juice. Oh, your phone's mm -hmm. beeping? Yeah. All right. Well, if we lose you, I'll say goodbye now. I uh, I thought the pilot was incredible. I think one of it's the great. great one of the great what ifs is what happens if Gandolfini is in the Tortora role, which apparent not only not only did they film a whole pilot with Gandolfini in that role, but it exists, and I'm gonna get my hands on it at some point. I'd like you to see that. There's a whole I, pilot. You know, I, of it. I didn't. I did note that he was you know in the producer role. My phone is beeping. It's too much juice. The podcast is way. Too long. Oh, right. what is it? Oh no, that's all right. We is... Carol is telling me to go upstairs and use the landline, but it's no, okay. it's fine. Doesn't matter. We'll, we'll wrap Close it up. We've podcast. been talking forever. So the Tony Kornheiser show. I thought you should have called it the Tony Kornheiser podcast, but what do I know? No, I want a show because that's what I did. It starts on Tuesday, the day after Labor Day. Subscribe to you it. Get it on iTunes. Subscribe to it where people get podcasts. 
Uh, this was fun. It was great to talk to you. I talk to you when we're not on a podcast, but it was fun to do one when we're actually recording it. Enjoy the rest of the summer. We never talked about Obama. Damn it. Next time. We'll get to him the next time, right. and there will be a next time, and I'm grateful to do it this time. Thank you, Bill. All right. Bye, Tony. Bye-bye. Anytime y'all want to see me again, rewind this track right here, close your eyes, and picture me rolling. All right, thanks so much to Sling TV, the best way to watch live TV on your turf. For just 20 bucks a month, you can stream more than 20 live channels, including ESPN, TNT, AMC, and CNN. No installation, no extra gear, no annual contracts, just an internet connection, you're ready to go. Start watching for seven days free at sling.com slash Bill Simmons. It gets Sling TV on your favorite device. Restrictions do apply. Thanks to Headspace. Change your life in just 10 minutes a day with the Headspace app. They give you guided meditations you can use whenever you want. Focus on sleeping, eating, stress, depression. They can make anything work. Download the Headspace app. Start your journey toward a happy, healthy life or happier, healthier life. Either or. Learn more at headspace.com slash BS. Finally, don't forget to check out theringer.com. Some great stuff this week. Now that football and basketball are kind of coming back a little bit college football some good pop culture stuff we're we're starting to we have a lot of stuff to write about i thought we had some really good stuff this week the ringer.com and we have seven other podcast feeds as well on the ringer podcast network including the ringer nfl show which has been doing a ton of preview stuff which you need for fantasy and gambling and everything else don't forget about my new hbo show any given wednesday 10 p.m wednesdays hbo comes back september 7th with a football show because it's football season uh, we also have a splash page on HBO Now and HBO Go that includes every episode and every bonus clip we've done, which you can also get on HBO On Demand. Hey, enjoy the weekend, Labor Day, and then football. This is great. Safe travels. <laughs>